Hello, Perfites. Uh, welcome to another episode where we are trying to start some of these interviews, these great conversations, so that yeah. we can share the knowledge of other performers here in the Perfite show. And today I have a great guest I'm super happy and proud to have here, Lisa Walk. Did I pronounce it Walk? How, how do you pronounce your last name, Walk. Lisa? Walk? Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome to Lisa Wo to Perfites, whom I had the honor, the chance, the great experience to meet her at um, Star East, was it? It was Star mm -hmm. East, right? Mm -hmm. And um, she was a presenter. She joined us at the uh, performance um, roundtable that we were doing um, a big discussion there about performance, answering questions. And she's a great performer. And again, Lisa, welcome. And she's a, a developer experience testing engineer at IBM. But yes. one clarification, and she will repeat after, her opinions are not IBM's opinions. <laughs> so, Lisa, welcome. Um, can you tell us Thank a little bit about your experience? Um, I've been in the testing space probably since the middle 90s. Um, mm -hmm. My first experience was a client server app where uh, I was responsible for resetting the test data on the DB2 side and running all of the batch test, the batch back end and making sure that it ran correctly. We had scripts that ran the front end. Um, I don't, right now, I don't even remember what we wrote them in, uh, but more no damage testing, regression testing. We called it no damage testing then. Um, and from there, I've moved more into performance testing, but actually now I'm responsible for the test strategy for all of IBM CIO, uh, all, all types of testing, except for security testing. I don't have security testing, but I have everything else. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, security is a pointy element or perspective. Yeah. And I'm, I'm super happy to hear that uh, sounds like all, all, most, if not all, of your professional life has been in the testing realm, right? Not entirely, but a good chunk of it. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, first question that uh, pops in my head, um, what inspired you to get into the IT world, testing into all, all this, sadly, mostly male-populated uh, area <laughs> of professional areas? <laughs> Yeah, so I first became interested in computers when I was at the beach with a bunch of my father's friends and their families. And one of the gentlemen, um, if I remember correctly, he worked, he was a hardware engineer. And he was talking about how, what he did and, 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 and having to, he talked about some various different problems that he had run into and what they had to do to solve them. And I thought, that sounds interesting. I think I'll do that. And so... I was, I don't even, I think I was early in high school when I, when I heard that. And then as part of the school, I was able to take a couple of computer science courses, not in my high school, but as extracurricular stuff during the summer or at night. And I was able to actually learn to program before I got out of high school. I learned Fortran and BASIC, if I remember correctly. And so, um, and this is in the 70s when uh -huh. I did this. So it was very unusual to even be able to be exposed. Yeah. But at least I was and realized that I'm good at math. I was pretty good at doing the computer stuff. And I stuck with it. So I went to school. I have a degree in mathematics with an option in computer science, which was the closest I could get to a computer science degree in North Carolina at that point in time. And here I am. And I enjoy it. I enjoy solving problems. So to me, it's like a, a new puzzle every day. When when I met you at the conference, it sounded like uh, you were enjoying a lot this type of problems, this type mm -hmm. of challenges that we uh, often find in the IT world. And something from what you mentioned um, that is super catch, catches my attention is that you learned these programming things uh, kind of on your own before, if I understood well, well, right? It was outside of high school, but it was in some it was in some school sponsored stuff. So, wow. um, 
one LLC, if I, I don't even remember, one of them was spec, and I can't remember what spec stood for, but that was a two or three week little course where we were able to go. We actually went and stayed at a, at a local college and went to some classes. And then, the, and then the other one was Governor's School. So the North Carolina Governor's School, I was I was nominated and accepted for that. And that was a six-week course where I went and stayed at uh, Salem College in Winston-Salem for six weeks. And I was able to do programming there. And then um, I was able to go at night for, I think it was one night a week for six or eight weeks to Wingate College and took uh, a programming language there as well. So it is, it is really impressive because um, nowadays, I mean, uh, my age and I was used to, well, not that I, there was that much YouTube when I started, but it's something that today you can stream something, you can get the knowledge from so many no. different sources. But on those days, I admire that you chased it, that you went for the knowledge, you went for that what you wanted yeah. to get into. I, 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 yeah, I can tell passion <laughs> big time for what was uh, coming. And now, how did you, you became a very good IT professional for uh, what I can tell, but how did this transition into the QA world happen? Uh, let's see. So I was, I've always been good at problem determination. Okay. Always have been. I can, somebody can explain to me what their system's doing and I just keep asking questions until usually I make them think of what's really wrong <laughs> by asking them a lot of questions, right? And 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 I'm able to take pieces of information, okay, and go, okay, you're telling me that it does this and then it's got to do this before it can do this or it won't work. And just basically ask questions until I get good answers. So I had been working with, I've worked for IBM for 41 years, okay? And during that time, I've had various different jobs. But at this point in time, I was in services. And I had a, and I had a client that I had worked with a lot. And they knew my background, knew what my capabilities were, and they requested me to come work on this team to do the testing before it was released to product before the application was released to production it was a brand new application replacing a 1960s era uh application mainframe application Whoa. and so it was client server the back end was still mainframe the front end was visual basic and so there were a lot of moving parts and they requested that i come they requested that i come work on the team and that's how i got into it <laughs> Wow. Yeah, many, many of the best testers and I'm going to get into that uh, performers do not start like looking for that. They they have some skills, but they are like, ah, good. no, no, you're good at this. Come join us in a project and they end up like, um, OK, yeah, now I'm a tester. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And I'm guessing similar with performance, how the transition from QA to performance happened. So one of the reasons that they got me onto the team was I was good at uh, database stuff and tuning SQL queries. I had been, uh, I actually had taken a whole lot of classes from Bonnie Baker, who was kind of a, a really knowledgeable lady who worked in the performance area for uh, DB2 on the mainframes. And so I had taken a lot of classes from her and had learned a whole lot about how to find bad performing SQL and, and what to do about it. So that was one of the reasons they brought me over. So then as I transitioned off of this project from the customer and moved on to other things, I was working on all um, uh, ITIL kind of implementations, uh, service management kinds of implementations. And the users are allowed to write queries for those. Well, users are lousy at writing queries. You know, select star from, <laughs> bring back the whole, bring back the whole table. Oh uh, yeah, when it's a million plus row table, that won't work. Oh, so <laughs> right. But there's also things that you do when you do queries that are not good for performance, like saying not in. 
for instance. Uh, it's better to list all the values, even if it's not in one value, it's better to list all of the values than say not in the one value you don't want. Um, and that's because of how the indexing works. The index can't work for not in. It can work for an in list. So uh, there's things like that, that if you learn what if you learn what to look for, you can literally go down through SQL statements and go, nope, that one won't. You need to rewrite that one. You need to rewrite that one. And then you work at them and rewrite them. So it became obvious pretty quickly that I could fix people's SQL. And I got recruited to go work on a performance and testing team. Um, and it was it, and we were doing performance testing. OK, but I also was rewriting our customers' queries so that they would perform better. So I was also doing level three work for the help desk, rewriting customer queries. And from there, I've not done anything but testing since then. Wow. So. It's it's interesting because uh, you started more like um, performance optimization rather than testing, but uh, many times that goes kind of hand in hand. Right. And it's, it, it, it's impressive that I, on my developer days, and I have met many developers who are not, you, you just threw so many uh, details around the query optimization, right? They go and do in the database, insert one uh, record at a time, select one record at a time, or do huge data dumps on, a, as you say, a full table scan for um, select asterisk. All of those things are super interesting that many developers do not even know. And they're like, yeah, I can just bring all the information and have it on the client side, and then I can play with it. Ooh, how many clients are going to be there? What's the size of the database? How many of those things that you seem to be used to? And but just like, when when you were saying all that, I was smiling because it's like, <laughs> you shall not do that. And all of so many developers, users, and even testers, and I'm like, yeah, I want to see the whole database. No, it's huge. You don't want to. Can't do that. Yeah, it's in in it's it's at times cute, but at others is scandalizing. And it's impressive that as well you understood so many of those things. The 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 not argument on the database, which many don't even know that. Wait, is that like uh, avoiding the index? Is that like making my query worse? Can't uh -huh. I just uh, openly join three tables just like that? No, please. Well, and you can't join three tables if you do it right. You just have uh -huh. to. You just have to write ha have your queries well structured and avoid constructs that cause table scans or index what? scans. Index scans are not as bad as table scans, but they're still usually not good. No, and and, and I bring it because uh, in the past I remember so many of the things where. Uh, table joins that generated so many full table scans, multiple right. tables that were just like, oh, why are you doing this this way? Is uh, all, and it's it's deep and there's some information that we need to understand as performance engineers. I think it's mm -hmm. super cool that you know it, and it doesn't sound like you jumped uh, right away into the scripting, mm -hmm. automating, and trying to bring down the system train in your professional career, right? And generally, I didn't have to try because the they had already brought down the system, and that was how it ended up with me. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were more um, sounds to me in the monitoring realm, checking logs, checking what is the problem, and diagnosing, yeah, right? Right. And so, I wasn't looking at logs so much. I was looking at logs some. I actually would look at um, DB two performance statistics. Mm -hmm. And DB2 will identify if you turn on the right, you know, if you turn on the right parameters and everything, uh, DB2 will identify for you how a query is performing, whether it's performing good, bad, in indifferent. And we had some tools that would take that information and uh, sort it, let us sort it different ways. We could look at um, the number of rows read, uh, number of buffer pull hits, number of times the query was executed, all these different things. And so we can sort by all these different parameters. And so the tool made it very easy for us to hone in on what were the bad queries quickly. And uh, we would pick the top two or three. 
you don't, you know, you don't try to fix them all at once. You pick the top two or three that you thought were the worst and to, and rewrite those or maybe add an index for them. If you were lucky, you could add an index and not rewrite. And then uh, they would implement that. And then you would say, okay, give me another set of statistics after that. Let me see how you're performing now. And then you would pick the next two or three and work on those. And you just do over and over until they get to the point that they're like, okay, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and in essence, I think that's the... Um well, redundantly, the essence of performance testing and optimization. Because in, in the industry, I think this confusion, uh -huh. right, is like the tools and you have to automate and bring down the system. No, 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 no. We know it's bad already. Why why are you trying to automate? Why are you trying to do this all sort of complex uh, steps and details? If you already know it's bad, just try to investigate, polish it little by little and keep yeah. updating uh, or improving your system that way. And it's really, it amazes me. And I think it's great that you started from that, no, no, investigative perspective, Polish tune, instead well, of just trying to automate, I think it's something that many in the performance testing industry have that mindset that they go right away that I have to automate and bring down the system. No, well, from what you're telling, the system was bringing itself down already. Yeah. I don't, don't well, or performing or performing very badly. But yeah, mm -hmm. we we have situations where you know they would turn on a system, right? When when they would first do it, they would turn on the system and start adding users to it, and the system would quit responding to them. So basically, it was down, and we would go through and try to figure out why. And yeah, performance. So that was happening at the customer locations, right? So. In IBM, we needed to create performance tests to see, well, how can we get to 5,000 users uh, on the system? Or can we only, if we have a system half this big, how, how far can we get? Can we get to, you know, 2,000 or 3,000 or whatever the number is so that we can tell people, okay, if you're looking to support this many users, we think it's going to take a system of this size. Okay. Uh planning of uh, capacity planning, right? Capacity planning. So, yeah, a lot of what we were doing was to put out benchmarks that people could say, okay, if you're doing this transaction right, you know, which we would equate to this many users, then get your system this big. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it depended on a lot of things because with DB2 in particular, table scanning is really efficient if the table's small. <laughs> you get a great performance if you don't have but, like... Um... Yeah. And so developers are working with, you know, systems that have a couple hundred rows probably at most. And so they do select start from, well, not quite that bad, but, you know, do they would have queries that were table scanning, but they weren't able to see that they were table scanning because their amount of data was too small. When we would performance test, we were using the size of a system that was real based upon our experience with customers. So we had millions of work orders and tens of thousands of assets and things so that we would know if you table scanned. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you're not going to pull back a million, a million work orders and not know it. <laughs> Uh, that that's um, yeah because uh, pre-productive environments have always had that situation where yeah the performance is great yeah you don't have anything there I mean it's well yeah. sometimes it's uh, even with not much in the system uh, the pre-productive environment was bad and that's another level of poor performance and it seems like um, from all these movement and different perspectives in uh -huh. performance testing, because yes, you're saying capacity planning is not just testing the capacity, how far the system can go. Resource optimization, are we, um, I'm, I'm sure that you also walked into areas that they had the most humongous machines for platforms that, well, you, jo you only use half of it on the best case scenario, yeah, right? Seen, yeah, I've seen that too. And sometimes it's not, um, especially in the cloud world, I've seen situations where 
your performance issues were not because of the amount of memory or the amount of CPUs that you had, but because you hadn't signed up for enough connections to this cloud service. And so that was your bottleneck. So what you had to do was to up your up your subscription to that cloud service to get more throughput. That was a classic problem, even like um, uh, bare metal machines. I remember number of number of threads or number of connections that you could have. Yes. If it, that's not well configured, oh man. But my CPU is so low, my memory is so low. What's happening? Well, it was my well. Why can't I do anything? I've got this <laughs> huge machine. Well, your number of connections is not high enough. So you're not getting enough parallel connections to your machine. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, and and understanding all these pieces, all these components. It's not only about hardware. It's not only about uh, automation. It's not only about we need to understand uh, the big picture and give some indications. Helped as you mentioned with uh, some of the logs from the database, from the system, from the user. I mean, it's uh, a huge endeavor and very entertaining. And you were mm -hmm. mentioning cloud a moment ago, which brings me to. You have a lot of experience here. You have been in the industry for a long time and you have seen multiple changes happen uh, probably several times. Which ones are you seeing happening right now that are changing the way we do things and execute things? You mentioned these clouds. What other things are you seeing? Well, you went from, okay, so you went from bare metal, dedicated hardware, right? Then you moved into VMs and partitioning LPARs, which, you know, what it, what you called it depended upon what hardware type you were running on, right? So if uh -huh. it was mainframe or AIX boxes, it was LPARs. If it was, you know, Intel-based stuff, it was VMs. But still, it's basically, you know, I'm still carving up a machine, either, either way you want to do it. And then you went to VMs on oh. the cloud, and now you're moving into containers, and the and, and you're moving into services, so like uh, databases of service, or um, okay, we call it cloud object storage, but it's the is it S three? I think is Google's term for it. Um, the the file system on a cloud, right, where you can yeah. store files and retrieve them. Um, so those things behave differently. So we containerized an image that would let us run JMeter and Taurus. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this was what I was presenting at Star East about. And we write because we're running it in a Kubernetes in a container, you know, the if the container goes away, so does the disk storage. So we were writing our tests to cloud object storage. We had a cloud object storage mounted as a drive to the Linux image. And we discovered that that would limit our ability to load the system because that was slowing us down. It wasn't, it wasn't the number of, of connections to it because it was basically one write, okay? It wasn't that, but the, the lag time on it was slowing us down. So what we did was we changed our approach and we run with the local disk until the test is finished and then we copy it to cloud object storage. So there's things like that that you have to, it, it's <laughs> a little bit of trial and error to figure out what you can and can't do uh -huh. because you know how, how, how many threads you can load up or concurrent threads you can do in JMeter is determined on your resources. So if you're slowing down because of your rights to your disk, then you can't load as many threads up. You can't get to the same level of throughput that you would like to get to as if you were running natively. And so we changed it to run the disk writes locally, natively, right? And then copy to the cloud after the fact. And that works fine unless the test bomb's in the middle. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting because you bring so many uh, components that have changed from how we used to the bare metal, having our load generators ourselves, okay. what's the machine that we're going to use. Now we can just send it up there to the cloud, have some instance being created. But you bring a very good uh, point that um, I saw that even in bare metal, like some 
teams not um yeah we can drop all the results in a shared uh drive in the network oh the how is that going to affect your test that is generating hundreds or thousands of records per minute and uh -huh. some of these things that change into where you're putting it how you're writing the files are you understanding as well the performance test per se it's also another cool thing that with all the things that you're mentioning uh, that are changing nowadays yeah you don't run it in the in your own laptop or the load generator that you have on the basement you instantiate you bring kubernetes you bring uh your containers everything ready to do your right. test and all that brings all sorts of uh fun and games around that right what you were saying yeah it's it's it, it's a whole well it, th this is the computer industry in general right what you knew five years ago is not going to help you now <laughs> now well i well, Concepts, yes, but but the actual things that you're doing are generally different. Yeah. So the the testing tools from five years ago are generally not the testing tools you're using today. Some of them maybe, but in general, you know, in in general, it rolls over about every five years. It seems mm -hmm. like now, and it's probably accelerating. Um, it'll probably be down to three before long. But <laughs> you learn how to figure stuff out. That's what keeps you going. If you can, if you learn how to figure things out, then you can apply that skill forever. Yeah. And if you like to learn new things, I personally like new challenges. I like if 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 I'm ever bored, I'm going to quit. <laughs> because at this point, I could retire, right? But I haven't because I'm still enjoying what I do. And so, as long, but so that I'm serious when I say. If I get bored now, I'm going to quit. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, I think you won't be quitting uh, ever. Uh, the, the IT world, we always have something interesting, new, and challenging yeah. that uh, will keep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, most of them are fun challenges. Or I tend to say that we we end up with kind of a Stockholm syndrome that, yeah, we love it because, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the only way we can do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> But it's a fun journey, and it's okay. something that many in the industry are like, oh, I got to keep learning, I got to keep, and this new tool, and now it's this, and now it's open source, and now it's back uh, commercial. But that's that's what we're here for, right? Right. If it was easy, they wouldn't need us. Yeah, that's another one where you just made me think of um, in my sure. past life as a performance consultant. I used to say, why do I end up in customers that do not know what all performance? Well, that's why they are bringing you. And that's why they need the help. And right. many teams and organizations are in the same situation, even if you are internal, right? Uh -huh. But I think as well, with these new sets of challenges, um, as of today, because you mentioned a lot of uh, cloud and the Kubernetes, new infrastructure, like having data i remember you needed like a special database connector to be able to access the data and input any query now we have all sorts of differences also to bring data to us um as you mentioned services apis um graphql all, all these new technologies how do you see them affecting or changing how we used to think on uh, performance mm -hmm. tests so resetting to a known quantity is getting more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so used to be with the performance tests that I would do when I was working on the asset management system, we would restore the database because the systems were ours. We, could re we would restore the database so that we knew that when we were running, we were running exactly the same. We were getting back exactly the same number of rows. We were getting back... You know, we were running exactly the same queries. So we it was a known quantity all the time because it was our bare metal. Okay. Well, it was mm -hmm. LPARs, but it was our metal. Okay. They were our machines. We knew what they were. We restored the databases. We uh, would reset the web sphere environments, et cetera. It controlled the whole thing. <laughs> so with cloud, you don't have that level of control. And so 
Today, I advise teams to write the test in a way that it creates the data that you need to operate against. Mm -hmm. So you do your queries in order, okay? So you do your creates, then you do your modifies, then you do your deletes, okay? In there, you're doing whatever queries you're, you know, whatever queries you're working against, but but. You, you're creating your own data as you go. And if you do that, then you're keeping the environment about the same, but you're only operating on the data that you created. So if you have a system that has the proper kinds of queries on the database side, for instance, you should only be pulling back what you created. Uh -huh. You should not be pulling back anybody else's data that they created that happens to be in that database that you're testing. So you should be with the proper indexes, you should be pulling back close to the same number of rows every time. But you can't reset the image. You can't you can't reset the database every time like we used to. It's just not it's, it's not doable once the system's in production. And 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 many of these things, supposedly most of the time is your own cloud if you hire that, but you have no control in these changes that you mentioned. Like someone else is in the same. Um, mainframe that your cloud is uh, setting your container or your data or whatever. And so you will get... It's a shared database. You've got your own set of tables, but it's a shared database. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do now, and, and we did this to some degree when we were doing bare metal, but now we do, if we run into a performance issue, our first, our first reaction is just to rerun. It's just because... <laughs> And, and, and you mentioned it very well. I don't think the focus nowadays for performance testing is so much on load testing and pushing the system to extremes, mostly because of all these changing components that you're mentioning. Uh, I mean, yeah, yesterday something may have popped an alarm or something go a little bit slow. Check it again. Okay, now maybe it was a rollback, someone else um, yeah. stopped running a big batch job in our database so many things that can be happening and right. that got to be happening because we are now in agile times modern times where everything keeps evolving or mm -hmm. this report that we used to think of it, this is the performance test report no you're gonna have a heartbeat and this no. is your performance now and and, and and to be honest you expect it to fluctuate a little bit okay mm -hmm. and, and this is okay what's not okay is for it to go this way or worse, this way. <laughs> yeah, because a huge improvement as well is something uh, mysterious, right? It makes you wonder. Mm -hmm. and we have found problems, we have found performance problems with other people's services that we were using before because we do track our performance. And so we were able to, you know, we've been able to go back and go, hey, what change did y'all make on this date? And they'll be like, why? I said, well, all of a sudden you're a second and a half slower than you were. <laughs> and they'd be like, what? And I'd show them the numbers and show them the call that I made and go, there's where it spiked. What did y'all change? How do you know that? Because <laughs> we were doing performance tests. <laughs> and the, and it's very different. It could be uh, an automation, a synthetic that probably you had uh, checking the, the site. Or it could be just plain monitoring. And you figured out that real users were having this performance issue, not yeah. only about bringing down the system. And I, and I love that you have that perspective, like, whoa, 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 first investigate everything. Let's do it from other, uh, repeat, check, uh, analyze. Then we think if we are going to... Um... Well, light tests are expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> light tests are expensive, not only in terms of hardware usage, but also in terms of time. Mm -hmm. Because to properly do a load test, you need to you need to... Well, I always test with one user because if it doesn't perform with one user, then it's not going to perform. Exactly. Okay? So I always run one, even if the next jump I make is 100. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or the next jump I make is 500. I always do one first. Okay. So, and I generally, the minimum amount of time that I'll do for a load test is 30 minutes. And the reason being is there's, all, there's, often, start, there's often a startup penalty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you start a load test, you've got to warm up periods and all that. Yeah, the resources have to all you know. Sometimes they're not allocated; they have to allocate, etc. So, then gives you the other twenty-five minutes to average out that 
little spike you had at the beginning. So 30 minutes is generally what I do as a minimum. And so if you start doing, you know, four or five or six or seven or however many different load levels to, as you climb the mountain, because you're not going to go from one to 10,000, yeah. you're, you're going to, you're going to ease up to it. You're going to, you're going to run a couple that you think are good. And then a couple that you think will break the system. And it takes time. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to analyze all of that. Yeah. It's, it's not like, um, and and when you mentioned the 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 time cost of course cost of the um hardware resources but a performance engineer is not that cheap a good one and you have to also optimize like do we really want to low test and push this to the limit right now if we already know as we were saying earlier that there are issues happening right now right. you're you're wasting you're wasting money you're wasting mm-hmm. time and money and time is money to be honest so um yeah so Solve all the problems that you can find first, and then start your load tests. Start to think to Don't push things. Don't just jump into a load test. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, even even if you don't know that there are performance issues, there are so many other paths that you can take to find out instead of mm-hmm. just, yeah, let's push the system. Let's start automating. Mm, are you sure? It's a good approach to right away start and... It's something that I, I see many teams, many um, organizations that are like, yeah, let's dive in head first, low yeah. testing. Well, I, I think mean, automation is good for, I mean, automation is not just for your load testing, although you have to have automation for your load testing, no doubt about that. But if you're running a build test or a whatever you want to call it, uh-huh. if you're running the test every time you, every time you push code, through your DevOps pipeline. You should be capturing performance statistics. And this is why I draw a difference between performance testing and load testing. Thank you can you. track performance. You can track performance on a single user mm-hmm. okay? or a small number of users. You don't, it doesn't have to be a single user you're doing as a build test. Maybe it's two, maybe it's five, but it's not many. Mm-hmm. But if you're tracking that over time, then you you know if it's gotten slower or better or if something weird's happening, okay? Because all of a sudden, if it's taking twice as long to run, you know, this API or this flow in your build test, you need to go look and see why. And Mm -hmm. catch it early and solve that problem before you run the thousand user load test. And even that thousand user load test, you, you're mentioning DevOps, your pipelines. You don't put well, those type of things in a pipeline. Like, no, no, you do not put that thing, but you might kick it off via a pipeline, mm-hmm. but not as part of a code deployment. Exactly. That's that's like, do you want to hold? Uh, because Look, you say you load test, 30 minutes. Hold. hold a pipeline for 30 minutes? That's Well, 30 minutes is one level. Mm-hmm. It's... 30 times however many levels you're t- doing in your load test because you're <laughs> never doing just one. You're yeah. always doing at least two. Uh, <laughs> and usually our load tests usually are five. So um, that's our, that, that's one of our, one of our applications runs a, a, every release. They run five different load levels against the system about to go to production to validate it, to Mm -hmm. make sure that the levels that we know work fine are still working fine. And then we run two where we expect to see performance not so great. Mm -hmm. Either of them break the system, okay? But we just know that performance starts trailing off. So, but, you know, that's two and a half hours. Yeah, and that's, but, but that's pretty much you triggered it. But we it goes it. to a separate pro- process. It's not part of the continuous cycle. And yeah, that's something that many are putting like big uh, load tests inside of the pipeline, depending on the load test finishing. So the pipeline completes. It's uh, um, painful when I found uh, these situations. Or- and it's many would say it's common sense, but no, it's like for others, like, no, it's what performance engineers have told me for the last five, 10 years. 
And I love that you say that this five years evolution that no, but that was five years ago. Why are you doing IT stuff? <laughs> like five years ago, that's ancient times in IT world, right? Yeah. So yeah, you should have a build. I mean, you should have a build test that would stop your pipeline and roll it back. You know, mm -hmm. roll back to the previous code if the if the build test fails. But the build test isn't a load test, and it may not even be a full functional test, depending upon how long the full functional test takes to run. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to hit every I'm going to hit every module, but I may not hit every combination, positive and negative, of every API variation in a build test. Okay, mm -hmm. that's my full functional test that I'm probably going to run after. So yeah, there's. But it's still going to be automated. Mm -hmm. Just because it's automated, though, doesn't mean it runs as part of the deployment pipeline. No, no, and the, and and those those are some of the clarifications uh, that Gosh. many teams need mm, guidance. And as I said, to many is like common sense, but others is like, Ma, but that was a process, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I mean, just looking at the time, I got super excited uh, talking about this. Uh, being respectful for the audience and um, I think in the future uh, Lisa if you want to come back and argue and discuss more about these uh, misconceptions I'll be happy to but okay. to start right now a ramp down uh, of, of the show <laughs> what recommendation would you give to people for these modern performance times that we are living uh, things to do to take into account or lessons that they should be um, learning to be per better performance engineers in this almost 2024 coming soon. <laughs> Have every test that you run track response time. Oh, yeah. That would be my number one recommendation and track it. Mm -hmm. Come up with some method. If it's nothing but an Excel spreadsheet or an access database, track it somewhere so that over time you can graph it and see if you're doing this or if you're going this, or if you've got a need somewhere that you've got to address, and then start digging into why. Become, and the other, the other one would be become best friends with your SRE or your monitoring people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have to know how to run the monitoring, but you need to know who to go talk to to find out, hey, can you tell me what was going on with this API, you know, during this time frame? Or was there something weird going on with the system? Or was the database acting up during this time frame? You need to you need to have time frames and you need to have, you know, hard facts. And if you've got if you're tracking over time, you've got your hard facts and you've got your time frame. Mm -hmm. So that would be that would probably be my my two best my two recommendations for performance is track everything. Because there's no reason if you're running a test automated, you can't capture the response time. Okay? Mm -hmm. Capture it, track it, become really good friends with your monitoring folks. And SREs as well. Well, I, SRE or monitoring, whatever whatever name they go by, right? <laughs> <laughs> so some would say, no, no, they are different. But eh, even, even performance engineers, we become at time uh, SREs, uh, monitoring engineers. Uh, and I must the lines admit, are super blurry in this. Yeah, I must admit yeah. that when I came into the job I had before this, I was actually assigned to an application team. And I learned the monitoring tool that was in place when I got there. Mm -hmm. And then they changed it. And I learned that one. And then they changed it again, and I got mad and didn't. <laughs> yeah. I said, no, y'all can just, y'all can do the monitoring stuff and just tell me. I'm not learning another tool. <laughs> the the, the best to keep up with. <laughs> I think on those tools, once you learn a couple of them, it's so almost like programming. Like, yeah, I, the, I have this code running in my head. It's just like one language or the other or Small differences. It is, it is to a certain degree, but you've got to get, you know, you've got to figure out exactly how do you navigate down and this. Oh, that, well. Yeah. Mm. It gets, it, the third one just broke me is all I can say. <laughs> when it got to the third one, I was, and it was the third one in a year. Oh. Yeah. 
it was just too much. And I was like, I don't have time to do, I don't have time to deal with this. Okay. Uh, why so many in a year? I mean, uh, okay. Can that's, I, that's can another. <laughs> can't answer that question. I think the first one, I was on the tail end of it. Mm -hmm. And then the second one maybe only lasted about nine months. And then we were moving to the third one. And it was the third one that I just said, me, I'm not bothering. <laughs> But but as you as you very well say, I think some of those yeah you don't need to be the monitor master, but uh, know who is and know who can give you access or hold your hand through all the information that is happening because yeah getting to the drill downs and the traces and some of that if it's a new platform can get interesting. Um, I love that recommendation. Like be good friends with these people. If you can learn how to do it, but uh, if you don't have that bandwidth, because yeah, time and bandwidth is important, um, okay. no one be friends with who has uh, the keys no. to that. And the second I love, I, I will rephrase a little bit how you said, because keeping the metrics from a response time and everything in your tests is super important. I would say keep them elsewhere uh, okay. than your tool, because in the past, yes. many tools tended to hawk them, right? And now we want to have them for posterity, for analysis, for the rest of the team, for uh, whoever may need them, even mm -hmm. like as tracking and for us to be able to analyze it. I love those recommendations, Lisa, and all the perspectives, all the experience, fun and not so fun stories that you're sharing <laughs> around all these um, IT endeavors and performance issues that we walk into. And before uh, we close up, any future plans like uh, Star East, any conferences, any other things that you have in the horizon well, coming? I'm planning on submitting something for Star East. Um, Star, West, I'm, Star West, I'm actually um, taking an extended uh, RV trip. And it oh. happened, and I had planned that before I knew the dates of Star West. Yeah. So I'm not planning on going to Star West, but I am planning on presenting at Star East again, or at oh. least submitting something, or at least submitting something to present. We'll see if they accept it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I see high probabilities uh, for meeting <laughs> you up again in Star East. Um, everyone watching, listening, uh, stay tuned because uh, Lisa is going to be rocking not only the RV but. Uh, some more presentations, conference time, lots of knowledge. And uh, Lisa, if anyone wants to follow up more with you or get in touch, ask you uh, all of the wisdom that you have, any questions, where can they find you? They can find me on LinkedIn. Um, trying to, I think I'm out there as Lisa J M Waugh. So W A U G H. I'll send you the I'll send you the URL and you can include it. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure to add Lisa's uh, LinkedIn um, contact. And uh, for any other thing, if you want to follow up with her, know what she's up to, what she's presenting, or have a question, uh, everyone, she's a huge amount of information, experience, knowledge, awesome. Uh, sorry that I say, in my personal opinion, one of the best performers that I have met. I was super happy of Thank meeting her. Thank you very much. No, no, no. You're, you're awesome, Lisa. And I'm super happy that you also accepted to come here and share your knowledge, your stories, and all the experience here with everyone in Perfites. Thank you so much, Lisa. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. It was awesome. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for tuning in, for listening or watching, depending on where you are seeing us. Uh, we'll be trying to be creating a little bit more content, more information, more experiences, um, more shows, and keep fights rolling and uh, I'll see you around and let's see what else we can come home and uh, come with and with that well ramp down is over Lisa thank you very much uh, again for coming here with You're us awesome. yeah. and everyone see you soon and adios perfites out mm -hmm.